listen brethren without love fellowship is impossible just imagine what a pain it will be for you to live with someone you don't love if the person loves you he will live with you he will be satisfied with you when he finds you around but you will notice that when the person is around you are irritated you are not satisfied let's take this situation where love is one sided somebody loves you you don't love the person back the person will always seek to be with you and you look at it as a burden every time you say but why is this person always wanting to be close to me i don't want so in that relationship then who is suffering is not the one who loves because the one who loves enjoys your presence but you because you don't love your heart is paining that this one you don't love should go away so that you can get the one you love to be close to you this is how burdensome it is for some people to follow jesus because they don't love him and what i've just described to you is a curse let's go to uh, um First Corinthians chapter 16. First Corinthians 16. I am trying to demonstrate to you from the word of God that it is impossible for you to be with the Lord, not because there's something wrong with God, but because you don't love him and therefore you cannot be with him you realize that sooner or later you walk away from the lord for lack of love first corinthians 16 let's go to verse 22 if anyone does not love the lord jesus christ let him be a curse o oh lord come have you seen that in your versions can you read it in your bibles i want everyone to read aloud let it sound inside you just read what you find there at the same time everybody just raise your voice and read in any version so there are two things there if anyone does not love the lord that person is accursed lord come so it's written by someone who loves the lord is asking the lord to come now this is a truth that if the love of god is not in your heart you are cursed that's the love for jesus listen again that is if the love for jesus is not in your heart you are cursed please listen it does not mean that god is wicked then when he looks at you and realize you don't love me i curse you that's not the point many people don't understand what curse is if you know what curse is you realize that curse comes automatically when you don't love god let me give this analogy before we read other scriptures listen suppose there's somebody who is designated to help you in life but you don't love him and because you don't love him you are always running away from him then you are cursed what is the curse your helper will never be close to you because you are running from him that is the curse it's automatic It's not that the one who wants to help you and you hate him is the one destroying you but the fact that you are running from him you are just destroying yourself because you cannot get the help that is with him whenever you find him coming you are running away I want us to read a passage in Genesis chapter 3 so that you see the curse when the love of God was taken from the heart of Adam and Eve by the devil through cunning deceit you see the curse genesis 
Let me read verse 6 to verse 8. Or to verse 9. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took it, took of its fruits and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now this is what God said they should not do. After Satan convinced them, the Bible says that Suddenly, the woman saw that the fruit is good to eat. What God does not want is good. That immediately tells you that the love of God had been removed from their hearts. They are now seeing the things that God does not want as good. And I want to tell you that it also means that the things that God wants, they ultimately see them as bad. That is the world in which we live. Godly things to the world is bad. It's not pleasing. It's irritating. But godless, godless things are so pleasing and people see as good. So when the love of God, when, when the love for somebody is not in your heart, whatever that person does, somehow you find a problem with it. But do you know that when you love somebody, even his mistakes, you just love them? Yes. When you love somebody, when a person makes mistakes, you just accept the person with the mistake. When others are trying to say things, you say, no, 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 no. You people judge, you judge too much. Don't you, don't you also make mistakes? Amen. Now, when this woman ate, she gave to her husband, her husband ate, verse 7, then their eyes, both of their eyes got open and they knew that they were naked And they sew fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, I want you to picture something. There were only two of them in that garden. And therefore, whatever nakedness that is mentioned here, they had no problem with it. You see that when the love of God left their hearts, the love for each other also disappeared. They decided to hide from each other too. That is why when you hate somebody, you don't share your secrets with that person. That nakedness is the nakedness of transparency in anything that is in your heart. When you love somebody, you realize that your secrets just begin to flow to that person. But you will not tell those secrets to people you don't love. In fact, if you tell your thing to somebody and they take it to the one you don't love, you don't like it. That is why people who hate God cannot pray. They can't tell God their situation. Now we go ahead in verse 8. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Did you see that? That is when love is taken away. Did you see that they sowed fig leaves to cover themselves from each other? But they also hid themselves from God. What happened at the fall is that the possibility to love God was taken away from man by Satan. And you may ask, how did he take it away? Please listen, let me give other examples so that you may understand. It might be deeper than this because Satan has the ability to do things better than man. But imagine a, a woman, a beautiful woman married to a man and there's another one outside desiring to, out of jealousy, not wanting that woman to be with this man. What do you think that that man will do? Because the man outside has a problem with this man who is married to this woman. And out of jealousy, the man outside called Peter wants to destroy the marriage of this one called Joseph. Because he has a problem with Joseph. So he wants to destroy whatever is good for Joseph. That is a picture of Satan and God. And the best way for him to do that is to confuse this woman or convince this woman and turn this woman's heart 
away from the husband. That is, do something that this woman will begin to run away from the husband when the husband is coming. The husband will still love the woman, but something will happen in the woman's heart that will not love this man anymore. And when this man is coming, the woman will be running away or hiding. I don't want him to see me. That is what is happening with mankind. When the love of God is taken from your heart, the presence of God is so terrible for you. You hate it. You go to some places, you mention Jesus, people just get angry for no reason. You haven't insulted them. You just say Jesus, they are uncomfortable. The whole place becomes uncomfortable. It's, because, it's as if you have used a curse word in their meetings. Why? They don't love the Lord. And then here is the curse. The curse is not with God. The curse is with the man who does not love the Lord. What is the curse? That thing that makes you want to run away from God's presence. That thing that makes the presence of God boring to you is a curse. Because you are running from your helper. You are running from the one who wants to do you good. And because life is in God and you are running from life, you can never have life. Therefore, you are cursed. It's not that God is throwing curses at you. In the, in the superstitious world, you understand curses as somebody spreading something on you, therefore he has cursed you. No. The true meaning of curse is to cut you off from God's blessing. That's the true meaning of curse. That is, if I have my children, and for some reason they get a wrong idea from their friends outside, and when they see me coming, they run away from me, Yet I want to do them good. They are cursed because they will never benefit from my good. That is the curse. God has called us to be with him. It is, and by being with him, we become like him and we benefit from everything. If a woman is married to a man in community, community of property, they will have to enjoy it together. They have to live together in order to enjoy it together. If they start to separate, at some point the matter will go to court and they, whatever property is there have to be divided and it will not be common anymore. Whatever blessing you get from God is tied to you being with God. And if you cannot be with God, you cannot get any goodness of God. When I say goodness, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about what money cannot buy. Eternal life. The very life of God. So that is the curse. And so the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22, if anyone does not love the Lord, that person is accursed. O Lord, come. Now listen. Listen. When you love somebody, you, if the person is far away, you long for the person to be closer to you. I've often watched people, especially people who are perhaps admiring each other or one admiring the other, longing to marry that person at some point. You always find that somehow you find them together. Whatever happens, you see, for some reason, and unconsciously so, they may not even know it, that somehow it always happens that they find themselves together. They go for any meeting, somehow they bump into each other. And they ask, but why are we always bumping into each other? It's because unconsciously your path is being drawn to one another. There's something inside, love. You like to be close to him, he likes to be close to you. And so for some reason that force is drawing you together. And wherever you find yourself, you find that unconsciously that force draws you together and you are together. So too with the love of God. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
So God so loved the world and he did what? He gave his son to us. And because his son loves us so much, his son decided to come to us. And his son has truly given himself to us. But the problem is many don't want him. And therefore, they run from him. And that is the curse. If you want him, you desire for him to come back. Well, how do you be? Well, how can you be with the Lord now, given that He is in heaven? You can only be with the Lord in spirit. I will show if there is time. But I want us to look at this matter of being cursed if you are not with the Lord. You are not being with the Lord because you don't love Him. There is a curse. The curse is the absence of God. If you get to any place and they say this place is cursed, it means that God has totally withdrawn from that place. Actually, though man has fallen, God still supports man. But there are cases where God has totally withdrawn from the area, withdrawn from everything, and left them to pure evil. Then that place is true curse. The Bible says that everything in the universe is sustained by Jesus. When Jesus withdraws from something and stops sustaining it, that thing begins to fall apart. The curse begins to manifest by the thing falling apart by itself because the one who holds it together has withdrawn. The world in which we live is cursed and that is why it's falling apart gradually. Because the force that ought to keep it together has said, I am giving up this. Listen, in John 17, when Jesus was praying, he explicitly told the Father, I am not praying for the world. That's how I know that the world is cursed. Because Jesus chose not to put his blessing in the world. So if you run after the world, you will get money, yes. You may get money, yes. You may get pleasures in the world, yes, but God is not there. That's withdrawn from there. And whatever pleasures you get in the world leads to death, disintegration. Praise the Lord. So let us look at this curse that the Bible talks about for those who do not love the Lord. He who does not love the Lord, let him be a curse. It doesn't mean that God is throwing curses at you. You see, curse is the absence of God. If you move around, listen to this. If you move around, you find a fellow who tells you that I'm cursed. I'm looking for someone to break curses upon my life. Tell that person, what you mean is that God is not with you. Yes, curse is simply the absence of God. If God says this thing is cursed, God is meaning that if you touch it, I will not be with you because I've withdrawn from it. If you know that something is cursed and you go close to that thing and embrace that thing, you are actually walking away from God. So then, see, the world is cursed. And if you go after the world, you are on your own. You will disintegrate. When they say something is godless, it means that thing is cursed. Curse is the absence of God. When God has subtracted his blessing hands on something, it is curse. Curse is anyone who does not love the Lord. And uh, I want us to read Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, I want to prove to you what I'm saying about curses. It's part of being with the Lord, but this aspect, brethren need to know it better so that they know, you know that when you are like Adam, when you are running away from God, it's a mark that you are cursed. Sin is a curse. Whenever we sin, that's, that curse must be reversed by us repenting and Forsaking that sin in order to accommodate the presence of God again. While we are going to Revelation 22, I want to give you another analogy 
for us to understand those who are not being with the Lord are cursed. Listen, you will notice that when you keep sinning, you find that when they talk about God, you become uncomfortable when you keep sinning. Now, sin is like you come to somebody's house and you take poo and scatter in that house. That man opens his door. He sees poo, but you also bring all kinds of deadly animals, vipers and snakes you throw in his house. When he opens and sees that house, the house is so messed up that he moves away and cannot be there. And because the owner of the house has moved away, the house is cursed because no one can take care of that house. And therefore, these wild animals will continue to feast and infest that house. That is how some people get infested by demons when God withdraws. You've heard me say this, and I stand on it again, that demons cannot live in you if God is present in you. God cannot be present in a place and, and a little demon. You, do you know who demons are? Demons are, are bodiless spirits that God once created and because of rebellion they fell. They were like creatures like humans. They die at the judgment of the flood. And after they died, they couldn't go to God. And these fallen beings became demons. The demons are spirits. They are different from fallen angels because fallen angels have bodies. Different. The fallen angels that fell in heaven, the Bible says one third of the heavenly angels fell and followed Lucifer. They all have their bodies. They are not just spirits. They have bodies. So then when fallen angels appear, they can appear in a form that is visible, in a form that you can touch them. But demons can never appear in any form that you can touch them because they are bodiless spirits. Where did they come from? They came from the fact that God withdrew from them when their bodies died out of judgment. Their spirits had no place. And so they had no bodies. And how can such creatures that God himself created, how can Jesus be living in you and such creatures come and, and start to push Jesus at also one space? Do you think that they will have the courage to ever do that? Let me tell you the secret of allowing demons to infest you is to sin and put God off. Make his house dirty. Make his temple whom you are dirty. And when you are dirty, God withdraws and you don't want to repent because you are desires one more of that sin. God withdraws. And when God withdraws, the demons find it easy to occupy you. Jesus says that when you are delivered, when you are freed from demons, and the demons go around and they find no resting place, when they come back and find that that house is unoccupied, they go and call others and they come and occupy you. That is when God is not in you. When God is not in his temple because you have given foothold to another. When God is not there, other beings will come in. And they will make the place even more dirty so that God should never be there. There's only one reason why the clean God cannot live with some people is dirt. And what is that dirt? Filthiness, sin, idols, questions that are not from God, desires that are not godly. And then God will withdraw and these demons will take over. And your state will become worse and worse and worse. And that is a mark that is a curse. Praise the Lord. The Bible says when Jesus was walking, he saw the fig tree and he expected fruit from there. And the fig tree had no fruit. And Jesus cursed the fig tree and it withered and died. What was that curse? The curse is my power that sustains life in you, I withdraw it. You are not fruitful, I withdraw from you. Jesus says, if you abide in me, you will bear fruit. Let's read it before we come to Revelation 22. That's John 15. John chapter 15.
Abide means being with the Lord. John 15 verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Verse 3. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Do you see the link to cleanliness? What kind of cleanliness? Cleanliness in your soul. Cleanliness from sin. Cleanliness from godless desires and godless passions. The word that I have spoken to you has cleansed you. The word of God cleanses. You are already clean because of the word. There are brethren who do not value the word of God. No doubt Satan has easy access to them all the time. The words I have spoken to you has made you clean. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Do you see something here, brethren? The more we abide in God, in Christ, that is the more we are with Christ, being with the Lord. He called us to be with him, but when, as we are with him, we naturally develop fruits. Now, let me tell you something. Uh, permit the carnal example I'm giving. But let me take this carnal example. You see, once upon a time, this man got married to this woman, and this woman was so excited because she wanted fruits, the fruit of the womb, as baby. And this woman was excited. And finally, I've seen girls carrying babies, and I desire to carry baby to a baby that is a human being that can, I can hold and look and, and get some, some joy of the face of a man. But then when she got married, she never had time to abide with her husband. She could never be with the husband because she was so busy doing many things and never being able to be with the husband. After some years, she noticed that she had no baby. And she was asking why, questioning why is it that I'm not being blessed with a baby? The answer was, you have refused to be with your husband. So you cannot have the fruit from your husband. How can we expect to be fruitful in Christ-likeness if we cannot abide with Christ? The Lord has called us to be with him and the Bible says that as we behold his glory, we are changed to the likeness of that glory. When you abide with him, what do you see? The Lord, the Lord, all the time. You don't see him with your naked eyes, but in your thoughts, in your spirit is the Lord. The more you abide, the more you become like him automatically. You don't have to struggle. If a woman just submits to the husband and abides with the husband and everything is fine, she will not struggle. The fruit will come naturally. If a branch abides with a tree, when the tree is fruitful, that branch will also be fruitful. So then that branch will bear fruits that resemble this tree. And the reason is because it abides. Jesus says, you have to be with me and continually be with me. That's the meaning of abide before you can be fruitful, before you become like Christ. Are you a Christian who is one leg in, one leg out? You have so many activities outside that you have to do. Therefore, you don't have time for the Lord Jesus. I listened to somebody spoke. Are the Muslims, you know, they pray three times a day. Is it three? Is more. Early in the morning, you get every day. They do that every day. Without fail. Have you lived in a Muslim neighborhood? Have you lived there? When you hear that sound, is, is it usually at four o'clock or five? Five o'clock. You hear that sound. They are not sleeping on their bed and making that sound. They left their houses 
took taxi and went to the mosque and went there and climbed up the tower there and they are blowing that noise. It means that they woke up at four. It means that they woke up at four to go and blow that thing. Then when they go, they watch after some hours, they go back there again. And can you imagine they do that every day? Every day. And Sunday you say it's too much. One Sunday you come to church. You say, I want to come and come to, and skip one week. And then come the other week and skip another week. Don't be surprised you are not fruitful in Christ's likeness. You don't want to abide with the Lord. You are a visitor. And because you are a visitor, somebody cannot visit a man's house and then suddenly have pregnancy unless something is terribly wrong. Amen. They must be glued together in holy matrimony for the rest of their lives before you start to see fruits, if it is godly fruits. If you cannot abide with the Lord, forget. Abide means to continually be with him. The Lord caused us to be with him. He caused us to abide with him. And I've shown you that you cannot abide with the Lord without love. If you don't love the Lord, you cannot abide. You will stay a few minutes and you end up running away. I want to tell you something I've noticed. When people discover that in this church we don't put offering baskets, we don't ask anyone for tithe, when they discover this, they want to come to us because they're running from giving their money to other places, so they want to come here. When they come here and they realize the price to pay to be with the Lord Jesus, they leave and they say, better is tight than being here. I remember that once upon a time there was someone here, a married man, and his testimony was the place where I was, every time they would ask for envelope, every time they would ask for envelope, pay tight, give offering, special offering, and so on, they would ask for envelope. At least, since I came here, I've been breathing. He has always been testifying like that. But when he realized that he needs to give up his desires for Jesus, he could not stay here. He could not stay here. Amen. Listen, brethren. It is true. Anyone who does not love the Lord Jesus is cursed. Are you one of them? Are you cursed? What is that curse? The lack of God's presence. Revelation chapter 22 verse 3. It's describing that Holy city. Let me start from verse 1. This is where we shall be eternally with the Lord. Verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal. Proceeding from the throne of God. And of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, these are all symbolism. Amen. It's picturing the true life in Jesus. In Genesis, there were two trees there. There was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there was a tree of life. The tree of life, when Satan came, Satan did not push people to eat from the tree of life. 
Yet God did not say you shall not eat from that. The tree of life is free, but curse people run from it. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is restricted. Curse people run after it. Do you know the, the proof? You prefer knowledge to obedience. Yes. Because the tree of life requires yielding from the one who gives life. Yielding to the one who gives life. But knowledge puffs up. Have you read that verse? Knowledge makes people proud. But the spirit gives life. Praise the Lord. So they ran from the tree of life to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and Satan deceived them. People who seek knowledge and want to prove that they know, they are usually the candidate for deceit. It takes humility, simplicity for Christ to lead you out of deceit. I want to tell you that when it comes to knowledge, the devil knows far more than anybody in this world. And if you think that you can know in order for him not to deceive you, you are just setting yourself up for deceit because he deceives people by the knowledge he gives them. If not, how can you explain the fact that someone goes to school for close to 20 years, studies everything and becomes a professor and at the end says there is no God? Is that not stupidity? Has Satan not used that high knowledge to deceive him. And simple people who have no such knowledge look up to the skies and they say there must be God when I see the stars. The Bible says the very work, the very creation of God announces his presence that it is God who created. And who can look up in the, at night, look up the sky and ignore that there is a God? You know, when you ask these people, it's as if they have discovered all the secrets of creation and then they conclude there's no God. But when you ask them, what is the limit of the universe? They don't know. After, when you look up, what comes after? As you keep going, where is the end? And after the end, what next? That is confusing. Our brain are like chicken brain when it comes to God's creation. Yet, in pride, we can stand and say there's no God. That's just foolishness. And a simple person who might not have gone to school very far, says, Lord, I know you are. The Bible says in Hebrew chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who approaches God must believe that God exists and God is the rewarder of the one who diligently seeks God. I hope you don't have this foolishness of a big head that you, are, you have knowledge. And you start to argue. And at times some stupid, uh, uh, you go to some universities, you find some stupid children saying that God did not create the world. It was the Big Bang. They don't even know because even the ones who teach them, they, these things are confusing them too. And I want to tell you that humble people, both the educated and uneducated, always come to this one conclusion. There is God. Abed Enshans once said, that there is God and you cannot play dice with him. You know dice? This game that you play, the game of chance. What did he mean? That you cannot play the game of chance with God because he knows all things and therefore he will always win you. That's what he meant to his colleagues. So as he is credited for being the wisest person, he was a believer. And even this man, Isaac Newton, credited for being the father of modern physics, was a believer. He even prophesied when Christ is likely to come in some of his books. Brethren, I'm trying to say this, that for the Bible says that if you truly want to be wise in being with Christ, become a fool in this world so that you can be truly wise in Christ. Amen. Because the world, I'm trying to demonstrate to you the curse. If it's not a curse, what else it is? That someone will study everything. Somebody will study and find how complex human beings are. 
Just your eye alone. It is very clear that if it, it wasn't created, it could not evolve. And somebody will study all of these things and somehow out of some stupid confusion said we came from monkeys, we evolved. How can you explain that? That is the stupidity of the curse when God withdraws himself. The first thing when God withdraws himself from a man is that he rises and expands in pride and then falls. Yes. The Bible says that pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before the fall. When you start to feel important, feel great, feel knowledge, and you are seeking to know in order to do things instead of depending on God and seeking the will of God, it is a mark that you are going deeper and deeper into the curse of godlessness. The curse of lack of God's presence. Now, this is the beautiful place we shall be that is described. But let's read verse 3 of Revelation 22. And there shall be no more curse. There shall be no more what? Curse. So in this place where we shall be, there shall be no more curse. Why, brethren? But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no more curse. Why? Because the throne of God shall be there. And God himself will be there. God will be present. Because God is going to be perpetually with his people, there shall be no more curse. But if God moves out, there is a curse. Curse is the absence of God in a life. A godless person is a cursed person. You can come to church, but you are cursed because your desire is not towards God. You are godless. And therefore, you are disintegrating. And yet, in your pride, you think you are progressing until you realize all things are finished. There shall be no more curse. Because God's throne shall be there. The Bible says we are the temple of the living God. It means that there shouldn't be any curse with us if God is allowed to be in his temple. But the difference is that we take God's temple and move around with it and do as we please. I want you to go to Galatians chapter 3 and see something about the curse. I'm trying to tell you that the opposite of being with the Lord is curse. The Lord has called you to be with him and to always be with him. And once you are with him, there's no curse because you are with the, the life giver. Curse is his absence. When you run away, let me give you another illustration. Have you heard of the story of the prodigal son? That young man who asked his father, give me my inheritance. I want to go and live by myself. I want to live independent of you. Give me my inheritance. And that story is the story of man and God. And God being the father, knowing all things, still took the inheritance and gave that foolish boy. Be careful when you ask things from God. Things that you are asking in order not to see his face anymore until he's finished. That's how some people are. When you find them in, in, in the presence of God praying, you ask, brother, sister, why are you praying? Oh, my job is being threatened. They have said that they are going to lay people off. Let's take a 20 days fast so that my job can be restored. And when they pray, 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 the job is restored. They say, oh, Lord, my job is not restored. I'm fine. They wait until you. After many years, you find them again praying. These are angels get surprised. That the last time we saw this one was five years ago. This is here again, sincerely. What is happening? Oh, his child is sick. His child is sick. When they withdraw from the Lord and the curse is manifesting and they, they send the curse, that's when they start to cry to the Lord. When the Lord blesses them, they go back again to pursue curse. A young man asked for inheritance and God gave it. And as soon as he took the inheritance, he moved away from the father. That is God. He went and squandered and squandered and squandered. 
And did you see that nothing about him prospered in the sense of godly life? Although the, 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 the demonstration is material things, but it's in the sense of godliness. The true riches of the kingdom. Jesus says that if you are not faithful with little things, who will trust you with the true riches of the kingdom? And uh, when they had got, got into the depths of his fall, and he remembered that he has a father somewhere. And he said, let me return and tell my father that I'm not worthy to be called his child. I just want to be like one of his slaves. Because it's better that I work in my father's yard than to feed pigs in this faraway place. That's the curse. Praise the Lord. And uh, I want us to read Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, verse 13. Listen to this. Verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Look up, please. What is the curse of the law? The law is a good thing. How do they call it the curse of the law? Because when you follow the law, the law says that what God wants, you must do in order for God to accept you. That's the law. The law is doing what God has prescribed in his law, keeping his law so that you can become righteous. So what is that curse? Because the more you seek to keep the law, the more you find yourself drifting away from God because it is impossible to keep the law. That is the curse. And that is what the Bible says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. God put the law to show man that man is a sinner. A man thought that God has given him an opportunity to do something and come to God. And as he began to do it, he realizes that every time he does it, he leads into deeper mess. Just like you will take the Ten Commandments alone. Let's assume that you come one day to discover the Ten Commandments from the day that your eyes got open to the Ten Commandments, you start to keep it. Will you succeed to keep the Ten Commandments for the rest of your life? And will you succeed to keep all of them? We take the Ten Commandments, but do you know that actually in the law, there are 613 commandments in the law. Actually, God, God's law has 613 commandments. In the New uh, Old Testament. How many of you even know the Ten Commandments or less of the remaining 603? And there are still some stupid Christians who, or stupid people who do not want to give, turn to Jesus and live by faith. I am keeping the, the, I want to keep the law of God. There is a curse in it. Because as you attempt to keep it and you're unable to keep it, you realize God is very far from you because you cannot please him by yourself. Jesus re release us, redeem us from the curse of the law. How did he do that? Having become a curse for us. Now listen, when did Jesus become a curse for us? Because the Bible says that curse is everyone or curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. But previously in verse 10, he says, as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, curse is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law. All things. That's what I just explained. It's in verse 10. Because we cannot continue in all things that is in the Old Testament. God knew that he gave his law for us to know that we need him in order to live. But Satan still uses it to blind man. To say you must keep it. And while you are hoping that you keep it one day, you keep marking time. 
and you are away from God is a curse. Now Jesus took it for us and he says, curse is anyone or everyone who hangs on a tree. What is this talking about, brethren? You remember Jesus on the cross? What did he cry when he was there? My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? That is the curse. That is the time Jesus bore the curse for you. He suffered separation from his father so that you can be joined to his father. Curse is the withdrawal of God. At that moment on the cross, the father turned away because he had become like us. He was carrying our sins and God could not look upon him. And he felt the absence of his father. And he felt the weight of the curse. And he was pleading. That is what Jesus prayed for in Gethsemane. Not to come to this curse. But he said, if it is your will, I will carry. And he bore the curse for you and I. If he did not go to the cross, we will still be under the curse, struggling to please God and be, uh, seeing that it is impossible to please him by our own efforts. That is the curse. So as Jesus took the curse for us, he now gave us room to now be with God and abide with him. But lack of love for him can still take us away from his presence. Not because he's sending us away. He doesn't send anyone in Christ away. So back to verse 13. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. And I've shown to you that that is when Jesus was hanging there and cried that his father had forsaken him. That is the curse. The father had forsaken him. And that forsaking is a curse. The son of God was cursed by his very father because of us. That is, the father turned from him. The father withdrew from him on the cross. I want to tell you something, please, brethren. Listen to this. For people who don't have God, suffering is too painful for them. Do you know that? Can you explain how the godly people of old died of persecution with joy because of the presence of God? The one who is not under any curse. Whatever other people are crying, they say the suffering is too much. The Lord is giving him joy in the midst of the suffering. That is the difference. The absence of God in your life is hell in itself. That some people, their in, inward heart is hell. That's why you find they're always complaining, always trouble, gnashing their teeth everywhere, everything. They blame, they blame, and they, you can blame everybody else. But the mark is this. The God of peace is not in your heart. The God of peace is not in your heart. Philippians chapter 4 tells us something that we should be anxious for nothing. But in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, we should make our request known to God. And when we make our request known to God with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, he says that, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. Where? In Christ Jesus. As we live where? In Christ Jesus. That's what that passage says. It means as we abide in Jesus. It will only work as we abide in Jesus because out of him is a curse. Peace cannot guard a man who is cursed, a woman who is cursed. That's out of Christ. The Bible says no peace for the wicked. So, Jesus bore this for us. His father abandoned him for three hours. Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. And he died, I think, around midday. And then they lowered him, lower him from the cross around three o'clock. The Bible mentioned the hours. He was crucified at that time when 
he, he spent some time on the cross in that pain. And after that, when he was about to die, he cried because his father had totally forsaken him. The death of a believer is less painful than the death of Jesus. Jesus died a very painful death because he died without the comfort of the father. And the father could not comfort him because the father could not behold sin. And he, Jesus, had taken the form of a human being. And so Jesus was with us and the father was cut off. And that was the curse. And he did it for you and I, not because he was a sinner. You and I were cursed because we're sinners. And Jesus took the curse like that. Jesus could choose. And the father could grant that, that choice not to go to the cross. And he will still go back to heaven. But no human being will be saved. Because no one could take the curse away. Except Jesus. And that is what, when if you know the implication that you are able to call upon the name of the Lord so smoothly like this now, because of this curse that Jesus lifted, you always live in humble thanksgiving. Amen. And he says, it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14, that the blessings, so why did he leave that curse? Why did he redeem us from the curse? By hanging on a tree, so that the blessing, one blessing, did you see that? It's not blessings with S, it's one. Verse 14, so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the Holy, the promise of the Spirit through faith. It is actually that we might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. That is the meaning of this verse. Who is the Holy Spirit? The very person of God. Did you get the point? That the curse was the absence of God? And Jesus redeemed us from the curse so that God can come to us and we can go to God and become one with him and abide with him and be fruitful. That is become like Christ, one of the sons of God. And be with him for in eternity. I just showed you in Revelation 22 how our eternal place will look like. The throne of our father will be there. And the throne of our Lord Jesus will also be there. And there shall be no more curse there. When they say no more curse, it means curses come in episodes. There are some people who will be cursed for a period of time. Then God, when they, they, they turn their heart to God, God comes back and the curse is lifted. There are others who are cursed and they get destroyed. Like Judas Iscariot, for example. Do you know that Peter was cursed for a moment when he denied Jesus? And Jesus restored him. The absence of God in your life is a curse. Never forget, wherever you go to, let this ring in your minds. When you are about to take steps into sin, know that I'm going now into curse because this thing I'm about to do, God is not with me, therefore I'm going into a curse. Know that. And perhaps it will help you to say, oh no, I don't want to go into something that God will leave me there. I was urging the brethren as we we're praying this morning, the leaders, to tell the brethren that when you are planning to travel anywhere, discuss the matter with your local leadership and pray with your local leadership. Because it can happen that you are stepping out like this without consulting God, you are going away from the will of God without knowing. People have taken a short journey somewhere. And when they go, there's some little thing happen that shifts them completely away from God's presence and they never return. Do you know how Judas became what he became? Let me tell you one simple thing about Judas. He loved the presence of the Pharisees. And whenever he goes to the council of the Pharisees, God was not there because they were plotting against Jesus. Yet he loved it because he loved great things. 
That is how occasion came for him to say Jesus while he was present. They were discussing the matter. Jesus did not go to them to say, I want to say somebody called Jesus, is there a buyer? No. He was present when they were discussing about Jesus and he heard it. He, he was just fellowshipping with the, the, the ungodly. Let us read the passage in Psalms 1. You can fellowship with the ungodly and say, yeah, they're they, they my, my, my this, my that. But you are, you are destroying your own self. Psalm 1. I'm trying to point to you that Judas's problem came because Judas was not faithfully with Jesus. Whereas the other disciples were when Jesus was physically present. Psalm 1. Are we there? Let me read. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Look up, please. Do you know the opposite of curse? Is blessing. The absence of God is a curse. The presence of God is a blessing. And the blessing is not money. They are cursed people who have become millionaires, but they are decaying. Take note of this. Because you might think that when I'm a millionaire, it means that I'm blessed. No, you are not blessed. Some of the richest people in this corrupt, evil world are not godly. They are going to hell. That is the life of God. The little life that was left in them is oozing out, even in the presence of their money. So don't be moved by preachers who preach that when you come to God, God will make you a millionaire. No. When you come to God, God will make you his own. Which one is better? For the president to give you money or for the president to give you himself? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law, in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the river of water. The same thing we are told in Revelation 22. He will be like a tree planted in the, on, in the river, by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit. In season, Jesus says, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, you bear fruits. 